on the Desk podcast. I'm Will. And I'm Ryan. And we're joined here today by friend of the desk, Jeff Merloni. Hello, I'm Jeff Merloni. And we're <laughs> here. to be here. I, just, I have to say this desk is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to compliment the walnut desk. It's, it knows. It's ego is inflated enough already. Um, today we're going to talk about conspiracies. Yeah, and first we'll just do a little bit of defining. So conspiracy itself is defined as a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful, which is interesting because there's negative connotations to the word conspiracy alone. Uh, and conspiracy theory is defined as a belief that some covert but influential organization is responsible for a circumstance or an event. And I think we need to clarify the definition because there there are different types of conspiracies, right? The conspiracy theory uh -huh. is sometimes a wild uh, stringing together of facts right. that allow people to come to a conclusion that some power greater than them is controlling their circumstances. There are also true conspiracies of a bunch of people getting together, planning to do something unlawful, and either succeeding or not succeeding, but some of these things are true that we might talk about later today. I want to start with one that may or may not be true, and I think you two are going to come up with a hard stance on whether or not it's true. <laughs> but So one night I'm sitting, I don't have cable, so I'm sitting in my living room and I use the YouTube app a lot. And I don't know how this got funneled directly to me. Mm -hmm. However, I was shown a video of this man named David Icke, and he was talking about the conspiracy of what's called Project Lucifer, uh -huh. or the, the desire to turn Saturn either into or back into our second sun. So, like, the fact that it's called Project Lucifer, and then the segue is or to create a second sun out of Saturn is the first place where I get deeply confused. But let's follow the logic. What, yeah, let's unpack okay. this one. So he seems to think that through ancient iconography, all the way back to Egypt and potentially beyond, there were observations of Saturn being revered as a celestial god in the sky. Okay. Um, he claims that Saturn was brighter back in the day than it is now, which seems plausible. Um, and he points to a lot of different things throughout history, um, circular iconography with a, a halo on top, supposed to represent the rings of Saturn, and also wings on the outside of that, supposed to represent Lucifer or Lightbringer or the, the bright star in the sky. Or just like wings anywhere, too. Wings points anywhere? To a lot of wings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Saturn is, is symbolized by... Circles yep. and wings. Circles and wings. And he does this thing in his PowerPoint, which I think is supposed to confuse people who have short attention spans. This was my observation. Where he goes from talking about this ancient iconography, and then he zooms in on a set from Madonna's Super Bowl performance. Or he goes and talks about <laughs> the Rothschilds, you know, seeming to be wearing costumes that that draw to mind wings or winged iconography. He uh, also shows the Bentley, the Chrysler, the Tesla, and the Harley Davidson logo okay. all on one slide. What about Red pointing, Bull? Pointing, yeah, Red Bull. Gives you wings. Gives you wings. Makes you into Saturn. And it blows Saturn up into the second sign. By giving you wings, does Red Bull make you into Saturn or does it make you into Lucifer? It depends on who you want to be that day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so, so this is like really, really far out there. We're starting with like uh, one that I don't see touching plausibility or like you said, like it's about stringing together facts, but the wildness of the string here is really far on the spectrum of believable or not believable. Yes. And it gets crazier, right? It does get crazier. It gets crazier because this is where I start to want to believe this, which <laughs> is going to be which is going to be a theme throughout these episodes where so, like some of them, I, I want to believe it, okay. but it's so, it's so wild and crazy that it's not possible. Um, so there is the Cassini satellite was launched in, I believe the late nineties to go observe Saturn's moons. Mm -hmm. It flew around. We're trying to see if these planets are uh, hospitable for humans. Mm -hmm. If there's liquid water, if there might be microbial life or larger life, like a, uh, like a macrobial life. Uh, so, Right now, this nuclear-powered satellite is at the end of its mission. It's done and sent back all the data. It's about to be deprecated because its, its equipment is old. It happens that it is powered by a nuclear device. This nuclear device is theorized to about to crash land into Saturn. This is a fact. NASA has released that Saturn is going to be crashed into by the satellite. 
which has a nuclear core. And David Icke is projecting that this nuclear core is going to start a nuclear chain reaction in the center of Saturn uh-huh. to ignite the gaseous planet and bring it back to be Lucifer, the bringer of light in the sky. In the center of Saturn. So how is the missile, or how is the spacecraft going to get to the center of Saturn? That's where it starts to fall apart from. So what's built there? Right. Is there a door? <laughs> Does Saturn it have opens a at the right time? <laughs> and is this a co-conspiracy between the human race and the alien race? Really? What do we both get out of it? The Saturn... the Saturnites? <laughs> I mean, frankly, I don't understand the the real benefit of the end game. So, like, in conspiracy theories that I'm familiar with, generally there's, like, a government organization or other organization that is plotting to do a thing. We got that covered, right? Uh, potential harm, uh, trying to create a sun close to Earth sounds potentially harmful. But then there's usually, like, the mastermind end goal. And what is David my, David Icke's mastermind end goal? I don't know. <laughs> he does say that the star of Saturn would be significantly smaller than the star at the center of our solar system, mm-hmm. which would mean that potentially we've added just enough light and heat to Saturn's moons to make them hospitable, which would then be an end place for oh. people to move to, or aliens to move to and settle and start to colonize the solar system and beyond. It's got to be a cool sun, though. Yeah, it would have to be a really cool sun. And this is where it falls apart, obviously. When you look it up, I searched Neil deGrasse Tyson plus Project Lucifer to see if he had debunked it. I've heard him say publicly that he doesn't go around debunking crazy conspiracy theories. He wants to educate educate young people so that they don't ever believe in conspiracy theories like this, which I Mm -hmm. think is noble. Um, Which led me down the, the tangent of some podcasts are claiming that Mike Tyson and Neil deGrasse Tyson are brothers. Okay, based on what? No evidence. Just just saying it for just saying like it. General sake. racism. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, last names matching. Mm. What if Neil deGrasse Tyson gets a face tattoo? Of what would his face tattoo be? The cosmos. Mm. <laughs> How do you represent that? On face? <laughs> it's like one dot, and the next one is <laughs> ten thousand miles away. So the rational explanation is it's not possible by nuclear physical standards by star science standards as far as densities of things that are required Mm -hmm. to create a star. Um, And also, it just seems like the, like, asymmetry of information Mm -hmm. between people who want to know about space and people who actually know about space and the (laughs) bros who sit in between and speak with authority saying that this is what's going to happen are the reason why conspiracies like this, I think. What if we just don't have the information? (laughs) (laughs) What if the spacecraft lands, it goes to the door, <laughs> goes down the chute, the lands in the chute. center of Saturn, and in the Saturn, for whatever reason, is there's enough there to make another sun. So then what? What if it does become a sun, a small sun with the same mass of Saturn? What happens in the solar system? Does the world change immediately? Right. Well, the world, the world meaning what? Earth? Uh, existence as we know it. No, I don't think anyone, you would have to be able to see it though. Would you be able to see Saturn? (laughs) I think you can see it. It would definitely be brighter. I think you can see it it with your naked eye. It would start fusing things inside it, gaining mass, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then gaining more mass so that it accretes things around it. So eventually you'd have a fight, our sun versus Saturn's sun, and... We'd be caught. What would happen to Earth? What if it's right in the middle? <laughs> right. Eventually, it's gonna Saturn's gonna be grow enough that it's gonna get big enough that <gasps> Earth is gonna be getting pulled by both our sun and the Saturn sun. So what if it's a ploy to launch our planet somewhere? Oh wow! If the axes are right, to like but, break it out of its. But then, if the masterminds who came up with this botch it, then our sun just devours the Saturn sun eventually, and we go down with it. This is my favorite part of conspiracy theories. Because, like, (laughs) I want to be able to have this conversation, and people like David Icke make it possible for me to do it. Uh They do the heavy lifting of the crazy connect the dots first. Uh And then they allow us to speculate on, like, what would it be like? I think the reason I like it is because I want to, yeah, I want to make a star. Uh I want to be alive when we create a new star. Right, why not? One of the questions I've been thinking about as y'all have been talking is like, what's 
the desire to believe in something like this. So like, Will, you said kind of for a conversational purpose to have something to talk about, but then also like the hope that you could be alive for a miraculous or spectacular yeah. event. The earth's whipping. <laughs> <laughs> whipping into think, the void. I think we just expanded it and it's no longer the Saturn theory. It's the earth whipping theory. The earth whipping theory. We end up, we end up out beyond the cut. We do like an interstellar oh, where time starts warping. Where people on goals? one side of the planet age faster than people on the other side of the planet because our disproportionate spin. But is like a e mm. deeply irritating narrator going to explain to us why and how that thing is happening as it's happening? I sure hope so. And I hope <laughs> that that narrator is David Icke. <laughs> oh, God. I hope he's gifted the role. <laughs> Not like Morgan Freeman? So <laughs> David Attenborough. We should put a poll out. You guys should vote on who the best narrator for... The fling theory. <laughs> I made it that because it sounds more like string theory. Yeah, it's got more <laughs> of a ring. Who do you want the narrator to be? Reach out on Let social media. Let us know. Media. Us? So from Project Lucifer brings to mind Satanism. How? Lucifer. Okay. Satan. The fallen angel. But like Satanists don't really believe in, they don't worship Satan. Uh, actually did a non-related deep dive into Satanism the other day. I'm going to read this quick <laughs> statement from the, the, the <laughs> Satanist frequently asked friends of the Friends of the desk are like, why does Wills know so much about Satan, about Saturn? And, <laughs> and why does Ryan know so much about Satanism? Uh, so th this is a quote from the Satanists PR team. Uh, Our position is to be self-centered with ourselves being the most important person, in parentheses, the God of our subjective universe. So we are some si sometimes said to worship ourselves. Our current high priest, Gilmore, <coughs> calls this step moving from being an atheist to an itheist. Uh, Satan is used it's as a symbol of pride, liberty, and individualism, and it serves as an external metaphorical projection of our highest personal potential, blah, 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 blah. So but like... So it's the American dream. It's the American dream, basically, is Satanism, yeah. That's a good t-shirt. <laughs> they do not, oh, okay, the last sentence is, we do not believe in Satan as a being or person. Okay. So this is yet another way in which David Icke deeply misunderstands whatever he's talking about. Well, he does say Saturnists are Satanists, which is where the, the clumsy segue came from. Okay. Saturnists, Satanists, you connect the dots yourself. Yeah, listeners, you connect those dots. <laughs> Try to connect them. I want to be alive for the star being born. That one I'm not on board for. I don't no. want to even care about believing that. Like, I don't see, like, like, some conspiracy theories, I'm like, that seems exciting and weird and terrifying. But this one, I just, it, I don't know. It doesn't have the emotional, like, cultish pull. Jeff's nodding his head in agreement, and I feel like I'm on an island here. <laughs> It'd just be way cooler if it were Mars. <laughs> Why not Mars? True. Is Mars hackneyed already? Well, we talk about other conspiracies of, like, Mars. They talk about from those photos. NASA finally released some photos, and they forgot to edit out the face on Mars, uh -huh. which is clearly just a rock. Right. People want to believe. That it's and a they face. want to believe it's the moon. Some people want to believe it's the moon because it's closer. Uh-huh. Closer to home. It would be really dangerous to try to turn the moon into a sun. I think. <laughs> that would be a rough one. <laughs> That'd be real bad. <laughs> How'd you go about doing that? You have to soak it in lighter fluid? It would last. <laughs> you do it the same way you would turn Saturn into a sun, which is not at all. Yeah, but Saturn's not made of cheese. That's true. <laughs> the cheese sun. That's all right, fun. so I guess we've exhausted Saturn. My hopes have been dashed at, here at the Walnut Desk. And that's okay with me. I can, I can move on. Because I... I knew it wasn't real. I want it to be real. But like that wanting it to be real is the th something we should keep talking about as we move forward because I feel like it's connected to a topic we covered in our placebo episode a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, how choosing to believe in something that you know has factual evidence against it or you really like some part of you probably assumes it's not true. Uh, if that belief can positively affect your life and you don't proselytize it to other people, then it's not harmful. So 
I think conspiracy theories can do a similar thing. And I think that's like what you were talking about when you're saying you want to believe it. I do. It's my own little Saturn placebo. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Good for you, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> next is on the list is what? Yeah, so next we're going to go into the hollow earth conspiracy theory. Hmm. And the hollow earth conspiracy theory is basically what it sounds like, that there is space inside of the earth. <laughs> How much space? We don't know. <laughs> but one of the primary proponents of this theory is Michael Sarian, who Will and I go way back with. <laughs> Many a night we fell asleep hammered listening to Michael Sarian. Yes. Michael Sarian was that conspiracy theorist who comes across as a complete lunatic, but he talks for so long and with such conviction about his points that you just can't stop listening to it. It's like a car crash in extremely three and a half hour long YouTube video oh, slow motion. Longer a than A lot that. of them are six hours. Oh my God. Right. Six, and he has an audience that doesn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you can see people? Because if you watch the David Icke video, listeners, you can't see other people Oh, He's yes. giving a speech, but it's in a convention center he may have rented out for himself alone. Yes. It reminds me of a video that Jeff sent me uh, last week featuring friend of the desk, Tom Waits. <laughs> yeah, Pesca Jamba. Tom Waits basically determines the course of his tour in the United States by following a constellation. The constellation... What's the constellation? The constellation was... Uh, uh, Hydra. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> Along, you know, draws a constellation Hydra on a map and <clears throat> picks random cities along those lines. So he makes an acronym out of all the cities, and the acronym is called Pesca Jumba. <laughs> and and he, then he makes a sentence. He goes through what all the different <laughs> words in Pesca Jumba means, and it closes with this press conference has an audio track of like people in the crowd. They're all screaming out. Someone says, you dated my mother at the beginning of it, but then the camera zooms out and he just stops a record and there's nobody in this room. Oh and my it's God. Just, it's just Tom Waits giving a, an announcement of his tour by himself in an empty church basement. Uh, so, but Michael Sarian is a different situation. He does have people in his conference center watching him. And it seems like people follow him on social media and okay. people repost his videos. He also he gave his phone number out publicly for a while, I'm pretty sure. Do you remember when we <laughs> called his cell phone number? Oh yeah, there was a, there was a it, number. <laughs> it did go to voicemail. It wasn't a yeah, there number was a, that was turned off. There was a recording oh, wow. of some sort. You could like get in touch with him. So he's a ground level conspiracy theorist who we can reach. He has a burner phone for every conspiracy theory. And Michael, if, if you want to come on the episode, let us know. We would jump at the opportunity to speak with you about your hollow earth thoughts. Because he thinks that there's nothing inside the Earth and that it's a scientific conspiracy to prevent us from accessing the technology of the past. And that it's alluded to in the Bible, and that it's alluded to all over the place, again, with just like thin evidence and ADD style um, slides okay. that never allow you to think about one of his points for longer than 20 to 25 seconds. And these are six hour marathons of oh, association? Pretty much. Wow. And so, okay, so like what's hollow earth, we, he doesn't have a theory for what is inside the earth. I think he does. He I does? think it's like lizard people is what my uh, best recollection is. Is like, that's where the reptilians come from. There's another guy who believes that that's where the UFOs are coming from, that they fly up through the poles. Okay. And, that the UFOs, and that's how they can escape so quickly. They can fly into volcanoes and crevasses and they can drill. Mm-hmm. You say crevasse? What do you say? Crevice. I don't know. What's the proper I don't know proper anymore. pronunciation? I probably say crevice. <laughs> this is the alienate will episode. I, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. We all know it's in good fun here at the desk. I like to indulge my conspiracies a little bit. There's a Greek myth uh, of Hyperborea, which says that there were giants in the north beyond the north winds which may allude to there being a hole in the top of the planet in the North Pole okay. where all of human existence originated. A Thoughts? hole? A hole in the top? A hole? The North Pole hole? Yeah. <laughs> so the people came out from inside? <laughs> well, the giants of old in mythology came out from inside the hole. They were beyond the North Winds. It was too cold for us to get there. Okay. But they, they gave us life as we know it, apparently. So there are lizard people and giants inside the Earth. 
I guess now that you put those two things together. Okay. They must be living in perfect harmony. Okay. From our other sci-fi and fantasy, what uh, what else lives in there? Gnomes? Dwarves? What, who are the... I believe Sarian mentioned some some measure of elves inside the middle. Okay. So we've got elves, dwarves, gnomes, but, reptiles, giants. Uh-huh. Everyone but humans. Why can't we get in the club? Did we... Are we, like, did we descend from something that came out of it? Is there a theory about that? Or... And are they still inside? Right. These are questions best answered by Michael Sari. And again, we'll put that request out to yep. you formally on the social media, because we need you to explain this stuff. Because this is whack. <laughs> Just like Flat Earth. What do you guys think about Flat Earth? It seems like it's coming back. Do... do you, does science have, like, a trend cycle? Like I like that? that idea way more than... Sphere Earth. You like... Yeah, I like, like the idea of being able to run off of the Earth's edge <laughs> into space if I ever wanted to do that. <laughs> Where do you go? Just float around. You follow You follow the fling theory? Like you fall off the edge of the Earth and you get flung wherever the Saturnists are trying to take us? <laughs> yeah, no, I just mean for fun. I'd, uh -huh. have, I'd have to wear really strong magnets. Actually, this is the first time that I'm having like an emotional positive reaction. I think I would also like to be able to walk off the earth if I wanted to. Right? In a spacesuit, though. Okay. Yeah, Maybe. you'd have to be in a spacesuit. <laughs> of course. Alright, so you guys came at me for, for <laughs> wanting to make another sun. And you guys want to put spaceships on and run off the end of the earth. To what end? Do you want to see what's on the bottom? No, just so that we can. What's I don't on the have the opportunity to run off the earth right now if I want to. You feel like your rights are being taken away? Yeah, absolutely. I feel aggrieved. Like it would be cheaper to run off the Earth than to to, to go into space. To ship. launch into space. Yeah. Right, and just because the Earth is round now doesn't mean it always was that way. So It could have been flat at one time. And What's on the bottom? I was just going to ask, like, does the flat Earth theory account for a bottom? And if so, uh, is there more Earth on the... Like, is, is it divided top and bottom? Didn't think of that. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> So is that where our gnome, dwarf, giant, and elf friends are living? It seems like the two theories, the Flat Earth and Hollow Earth, could end up having their problems and suggestions about things it's solved the same in the same way. way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Whoa. Flat Earth is the ultimate inter-D&D &D race <laughs> problem solver. Wait, is, is two conspiracy theories colliding to have similar, like... Solutions? Is that confirmation of both of them, or is that not? I think, us, we, need, I think we need an expert. Desk. Yeah. But like in all seriousness, this flat Earth thing is gaining traction, and there are like flat Earthers on Twitter and on Facebook and writing blogs are about how the Earth is really flat. Well, you can't tell. I know. But professional basketball player Kyrie Irving of the Cleveland Cavaliers who was in the NBA Finals in front of our faces for five games. Who went to Duke. Went to Duke, thinks that the Earth is flat. And his response to the press saying, you're insane for thinking the Earth is flat, you went to Duke. Uh -huh. You must have studied some rudimentary physics at some point in your life. Yeah. It, the laws of the universe don't work if the Earth is flat. Uh huh. Is, his defense of that statement is, I'm allowed to have my own opinions about things. It's not wrong. Yeah, you're allowed to have your own opinions about things, but you're not allowed to tweet it out to your million followers and all the children who are buying your pro model, like, shoe. Uh. Oh, I disagree. It's a harmless thing to believe in. Does his pro model shoe give you the ability to jump off of the edge of the earth? Ooh. If so, we want to go into business. <laughs> now. <laughs> Definitely right, right over right. way. Walnut <laughs> desk space shoe. <laughs> space jam. Shazam. Not a movie. Not a movie. It's actually Kazam. God. I don't know if I believe that one. The old, I remember Shazam. The old Mandela effect? The Mandela effect. Ryan, give us a little background. Well, the Mandela effect is the idea that uh, large groups of people remember specific things to be uh, configured in a way that they are not. So, for instance, the Baron Steen Bears, the books that I read as a child... Uh, with the E-I-N ending, are in reality, apparently, are the Berenstain Bears, A-I-N ending, and I'm just wrong, but 
You're not wrong. It was that way when we were growing up. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> so all three of us here at the Walnut Desk are <laughs> victims of a large Mandela Effect conspiracy, which some say means we've jumped timelines. Right. I was going to say, can I offer a conspiracy theory to Please? explain the Mandela Effect? Please. This is a WDP branded conspiracy theory here. Uh, I think that every once in a while, there's some kind of shift, possibly, and we end up in a very, very slightly different parallel universe. Uh, it could happen every couple weeks or every couple years or whatever. Uh, uh, but these Mandela Effect problems are the only changes that we've really noticed in the parallel universe jumps that we've made thus far. So over time, it may be, might become more extreme, it might become less extreme, but when you wake up in the morning, you might not be in the exact parallel universe you were in when you fell asleep the night before. Do I still exist in all these other iterations? Absolutely, yeah. But you can never go back. Exactly. Until we light Saturn ablaze. The Saturn door is going to open, and it's going to open the parallel universe door. <laughs> So what no, does that mean for us? I do think that's compelling. We have to kill all of our other selves in order to survive. I think we just wrote the first <laughs> Walnut Desk Productions movie. <laughs> it's like, get out. <laughs> yeah. So, but, to close that one out, I mean, unless... Go ahead. No, no, but the parallel universe thing, is anybody determining that? Is there any information about no, that's that just, aspect of it? Or know. is it just random and haphazard and... We didn't have any real research. This is just an idea of our own. Jeff, you bring up a good point of like who's pulling that string that says we we jumped to a new timeline. Is, right. Is there, is a there reason an for agent? It? Is there something we need to escape? Yeah, I wonder if we're constantly avoiding demise by making the jumps. Or are they just arbitrary checkpoints like I don't know, Sonic or something? <laughs> Or, like, is Bill Gates avoiding his own death by causing all of us to jump to a new universe whenever he's about to die? I think what's going to happen is at the end of this podcast, we're going to mash <laughs> all of these conspiracies into one true, one true narrative. <laughs> like, the reptilians now know that the universe might end one day, and they're doing all of these vast conspiratorial things because they've got that vision of the future. Mm -hmm. They turn the machine on every night, and you wake up, and the Berenstain Bears are... The, the Berenstain Bears... Which just doesn't roll off the tongue. Ugh. Anyway, so that's... Do we have anything else on Hollow Flat Earth? Because that was a digression from Hollow Flat Earth. Except that it just doesn't make any sense. Okay. All of the things that don't work with a hollow or flat Earth. Gravity. The, like, observed density of mm -hmm. the Earth. The fact that we have earthquakes. And seismic activity. Which means that our continents are drifting over a sea of lava and a molten core. Um, but then the question that the conspiracy theorists always go to the ultimate, it's like a similar thing to like the first mover argument in a theology course, Okay. which is like, yeah, but who says science is real? Right. And then it's like, you kind of just are back to square one again. Neil deGrasse Tyson says science, science is real. And maybe Mike Tyson too. I don't really know. <laughs> we should get Mike Tyson's official stance on science. <laughs> <Yeah>. Is it real? <laughs> All right. So what's next? We on to fluoridation? Sure. All right, so fluoridation. So anytime anybody puts anything into water, there's gonna be controversy about it. And since for, for a long time in the United States, I don't know if this is an international theory or not, but people have been thinking that companies or the government is are putting fluoride into the water to tranquilize people or to make them sheeples, per se. Ah. So when did I start? did a little reading on it, and it started after World War II when there was all this aluminum buildup from making airlines. So the government and this uh, private associate named Alcoa had all this excess fluoride, which is really just a degenerative form of aluminum. Uh, so they put, they started putting fluoride into water because they didn't know what to do with it based on <laughs> one test that a laboratory scientist for Alcoa performed on rats in which he determined that rats that ate fluoride or consumed fluoride um, would have a 50% lower cavity rate. Mm. 
That's desirable. I mean, so sure. They, yeah. So they dumped waste and then came up with a reason to justify right. why they dumped the waste. Not only that they should have dumped the waste and that it was beneficial, but that they should continue to dump more waste. <laughs> In order to keep our teeth strong? Yeah. Yeah, more fluoride, the better. But what does fluoride do to our brain cavity? See, I don't know about that part of it. Because there's more, there's more information about it, about what does fluoride do to your brain? What does fluoride do to other parts of your, your you know, bodily ecosystem? Yeah, so there is some real evidence on what fluoride does. And I'd like to first off start by saying the EPS, I mean, EPA considers it hazardous waste. It's so <laughs> toxic that fluoride is considered hazardous waste. It's also the same ingredient included in rat poison and Prozac. And, and Will, to your question about the brain, fluoride calcifies the pineal glands, basically turns it into a tooth. <laughs> what? And this is all this the, is all the above are, board. This oh yeah. is all scientific. Okay. And the theorists, the theorists who are tied up um, with the Illuminati, really focus on this point uh -huh. uh, because the pineal gland they refer to as the third eye, which quote literally has rods and cones. So they're stripping away our, our spiritual eye, the, uh, the yogic third eye, our ability to commune with the spirit world. Right. By turning it into a tooth. So what happens if your third eye shuts off? What does happen if your third eye shuts off? I've operated every day thinking that my third eye is off and that there's a reason why I don't present with three eyes. And it's because we evolutionary don't, don't fucking need it anymore. <laughs> Uh, I also, so like I Googled a little bit and so for the toxicity of fluoride to give listeners some uh, reference point, it's more toxic than lead, right? But slightly less toxic than arsenic. Oh, that's a great wow. place to fall on the spectrum. <laughs> what the hell? So like it will kill you and it will kill you. Yeah, is this gonna be like the 80s where they went around and they were like, oh yeah, look at we got all this lead, let's put it in the gasoline. And then the lead concentrations of the atmosphere climbed to like a ridiculous level and they had to go on this crazy nation nationwide, uh, you know, lead mitigation thing where they take the lead out of the paints, they take it out of the gas, they give, for some reason, they give you a three year cool down to stop putting lead in your paint because boo hoo, they don't want to ruin your business. Mm -hmm. Come on, they're doing the same thing with trans fat right now. They realized it was bad, it was a filler ingredient, it was left over from, you know, bad research done in the 50s and 60s. But no, no, you've got three more years to take trans fat out of food. Is that the new thing with fluoride? Like, is it. Is, are we going to find out that this is true? Because that bums me out. Because I know I've been drinking fluorinated water for a long time. Also, I'm pretty sure, Jeff, we shared a pediatrician growing up. My pediatrician prescribed me fluoride pills for at least a year. Oh, Dr. Wow. Daly did that. Oh, I also went to Dr. Daly. No Dr. shit. Yeah. We all went to Dr. Well, Daly. On that desk. Wow. We should Skype him in. Yeah, do we have anything else on fluoride? Like, Yeah, so that's the health aspect of fluoride. Um... But, you know, on the darker political sociological side, <laughs> the theory is that fluoride, like I said earlier, turns people into sheeple, basically. And that theory, given the time that we started putting fluoride into the water, um, was dug up right during World War II when people mm -hmm. in the United States were basically commissioning scientists to conduct studies to prove that Fluoride makes people, people docile and creates sterility in women. Jeez. Wow. Uh, there's a quote from this chemist named Charles E. Perkins, a U.S. scientist, uh, where he says, Repeated doses of fluoride will in time reduce an individual's power to resist domination by slowly poisoning and narcotizing the brain, thus making him submissive to the will of those who wish to govern him. So, but that's, and that's sort of like stepping off into the, the, like the conspiracy theory side of it, right? Cause it's like, it seemed like this is the first time we're all three of us kind of on board with being concerned about fluoride, right? It's yeah. like for me personally, if I were, if it were up to me and I had a glass of water that had no fluoride in it every day and I could put powder in it, like emergency, like I do sometimes, yeah. uh, with fluoride in it and the benefit would be. I could potentially have fewer cavities and reduced tooth decay. 
or and then the, like the negative would be I might die or I might be more willing to just do what somebody tells me to do. I would not put fluoride in the water. No, and we've spoken about teeth. Yep. We say no to teeth. No to teeth. So why would we say yes to fluoride to help our teeth? A, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. Because that's kind of like saying if you took an emergency, you had a choice between it like, you know, boosting your immune system with antioxidizing vitamin C and waking you up with B vitamins. And on the other end, you end up with explosive diarrhea at the end of the day. Right. You wouldn't choose to take the emergency. You'd find another way. Probably to, not. To stay healthy. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> There's still a chance. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a mild addiction on our hands, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> All right. So what else we got? We got experiments on the public. Um, so we're diving real deep here into the conspiracy theories and like I said, that was the first time we kind of like had a consensus of concern mm -hmm. I don't know if it's belief, but it's con at least on the level of concern about the fluoride conspiracy theory Yeah, did we have any information saying? Objectively that it's not dangerous like is all the are the conspiracy theorists assertions that it calcifies your pituitary gland are those backed by science or is this like a bunch of conspiracy theorists saying fluoride does X, Y, and Z. I was a little unclear. No, those were official okay. studies. Yeah. Science. Okay, so definite worry. Yeah, it's a real <laughs> concern and like the but like the ultimate win in the end was that we have fluoride in our water, right? Hooray. <laughs> so the public sphere has been okay with it. Right, and we're largely. still we're still experimenting on the public experimenting on members of the military seems to be the place where governments do most of their their experimentation because you kind of sign your body away to the the country God. when you join the military so back during world war ii there was this thing called the philadelphia experiment where they tried to make a boat invisible <laughs> with <laughs> with a crew on it <laughs> and how, it almost worked how did they try that according to various sources who were there as eyewitnesses that the boat almost vanished. It was cloaked in a green fog, right? Like Scooby Doo. Green right? fog, yeah. And then, when the green fog went away, people were in different places on the boat than they began. So this guy could have ran down the stairs really quick and ended up on the deck below, or he could have warped through the floor and ended up on the deck below. It seems that these people who were eyewitnesses think that his hand got stuck in part of the metal frame of the boat after it cloaked itself. In? That he was then became part of the metal. Boatman. Boatman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, was he able to get his hand out of the boat? There is no information provided about that. That sounds painful. They said that multiple people ended up fused to the boat, according to uh, this Wikipedia Entry, which did cite some sources, which I did not go and double check because what fun is that? So we don't know if they were first eyewitnesses. No. Right. Okay. But this is more fun. This is more fun. Of so course. yeah, <laughs> we're definitely not really checking our sources. We are finding all of this information as we do on the Walnut Desk podcast <laughs> on the internet. Uh, most of it is coming from Wikipedia and direct Google searching that comes up with like news sites where things are cited. So it's not like we're just throwing out random blogger ideas. Right. And it's also not like we're fabricating the stuff ourselves. We're providing you information that exists in what some people consider reputable sources um, yeah, that's so out there. But that's why you're here, guys. Pull up a chair to the desk. So what else? What other experiments? So like, okay, with the boat it's a nice desk. disappearing, can, uh, what, if, what if the green fog was an early way to jump into the next parallel universe and that boat went to a parallel universe where those people were in those other places on that boat. So we then wow. transitioned to the new universe. Like, they overstepped their power. Universe as a whole says, uh, yeah, we're out of this timeline. We're into right. a new one now where you get punished for the thing that you did. Punished? I don't know if there's a, a moral or we ethical... Did, we did ask if there was an agent earlier, and I guess I sort of internally decided that there would be an agent. Yeah, we'll... Pulling the switch. <laughs> Will's like, yeah, your your like uh, uh, assumption base includes a higher power. So we uncovered that. I guess. <laughs> Guys, this is heavy. <laughs> I learned something about myself. So what else is there? For... I would be way more apt to believe in God if that's what God did. <laughs> if true. he didn't create us, but <laughs> if he just 
kept pulling the switch whenever he wanted to. God pulls the switch. Jolting our source of reality when we needed it. This is better than Lost. This would be a better TV show than Lost. Hey, HBO. We're here. David Lindelof is kind of dropping balls, so we, <laughs> we can pick him up. Uh... We also we also brought up some research about uh, MK Ultra, which is like a real mind control experiment that was conducted by the CIA uh, to use after the the component LSD was synthesized to potentially use it to uh, exhibit mind control on the masses. And there are some notable participants in this who have either said on their own in public that they were members of the MK Ultra experiment, where they were dosed either like with or against their will. Right. Um, so those notable people are Ken Kesey. Um, there was also note from a biography writer, I believe of someone who claimed to be in Whitey Bulger's crime ring that Whitey Bulger volunteered himself while he was in prison to be experimented upon. Um, and also that a musician named Robert Hunter, who was volunteering to be experimented upon at Stanford where they were doing the experiments right. uh, was also deeply embedded with the Grateful Dead yeah. and the number one stop shop for acid during that time period. Wow. Yeah. So that's a real conspiracy. The government has tried to mind control people, which I think sets people up to believe that the government is doing other stuff. Okay. Like the government is doing chemtrails or like the government is manipulating <laughs> the media to think that there's all kinds of other stuff happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. that we either don't see, don't notice, or don't have enough information to pick up on. Well, it's also interesting that people involved in the experiment because the means kind of have a reasonable end there. Ken Kesey ended up making One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, right? And Fucking awesome book. Woody Bulger ended up killing a lot of people. So who's to say? <laughs> right? Maybe they that did control the them. Yeah, the results were extreme. So they, yeah, they actually they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. Which, if you were trying to control people, you would probably try to control them in multiple different, you know, on multiple different paths. I feel like it's possible that what when we say mind control, what we think of versus what sort of like the Pete, the scientists in charge of this experiment would use to define it might be different. Like we think mind control, what? what? What do you think that would mean? Like maybe just like having direct access to somebody's like ability to do like a, like a Manchurian candidate kind of thing. Like that or like get out. Okay. Like get out. Right. Which, I mean, if you haven't seen the movie, we well, won't I mean, see it. We won't spoil it, but it's a, I mean, it's a 9.8 out of 10. Yeah, for it's sure. Fantastic. I agree. Um, but like, is that what we, th is that how they would define mind control? Or is it just like, uh, I can put you on this drug, say some suggestive shit, and maybe you start to prefer Pepsi to Coke irrationally. You know what I mean? I might tend in that, right. to think in that direction. I don't know. Like most people think of it in terms of somebody has a remote control. Right. And they're controlling the individual. Mm -hmm. And that's where my gut went. Right. To be honest, at the right. beginning, I was thinking about a remote control. But more plausible is, is subtle. Like power of suggestion type yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which, Which, like, that's marketing. That segues right into this other whole media conspiracy thing, right? Advertising, subliminal messaging, um, ideas being implanted in you, or the truth being hidden. Yep. To a certain extent where, you know, stuff becomes all in question, which is kind of our current climate. Like paranoia, and you get, like, uh, figures who are, like, the the revealer of the truth against the mainstream bullshitters, uh, which like, there's a part of me that's like, okay, I mean, media is a thing that's used to push political agendas and ideologies all the time. Um, but I don't know. How do you guys respond to these would be crackpots? I'm generally not tuned into most of it. I really wish that I was because it's so entertaining. <laughs> what are the things that Alex Jones says? Yeah, so Alex Jones is like my like my least favorite person in this realm, I guess, right now. Uh, just because he's been so popular lately. But he's basically just the guy who covers all these conspiracy theories. And most of the time, often, they either really lean into like extreme paranoia or they benefit like far-right political ideology uh, and that spans from climate, climate change denying to like believing that gay marriage is a global initiative 
uh, that's uh, a conspiracy to encourage the breakdown of the family and to get rid of God uh, culturally. What? Uh, he also believes that, like, you know, there are these mass efforts to block access to conservative media like his own. Mm -hmm. uh, as most paranoid people tend to believe, he believes that the world is not just out to get everyone else, but him specifically, specifically. at all times. But Ryan, he's seen the documents. They are out to get him. <laughs> he's seen the documents. Uh, that's the worst type of person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Alex Jones, you suck. Oh, and just to, to do a really quick worst aside... Type. Um, our current president, um, has praised Alex Jones and a direct quote from our current president, uh, is your reputation is amazing. <laughs> so all the stuff I just said about him is true. And our current president believes that that is the reputation that is amazing. <laughs> okay. Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> do you guys never say his name? <laughs> No, I think it, it was an editorial choice not to in that case. Right. And I 100% support our official stance on uh, on the president who shall not be named. I just think it's a way to give the middle finger where it should be given. But yeah, so Alex Jones. Um, but we did, I mean, we have to address uh, a friend of the desk who left a, an important comment for us. Because we did talk about t climate change in our travel episode. Yep. And... Uh, we did kind of gloss over it as it wasn't the central theme of our narrative. We said something about hard science versus our own feelings and it kind of got jumbled uh, as things tend to and our very, very avid listener and friend of the desk, Jeff Shea, my dad, uh, brought up that we should avoid being uh, Nero playing his fiddle whilst Rome burns. Uh, yeah, Which I, isn't I, wrong. No, it's not wrong at all. I mean, if the sea level rises, a lot of things that we hold near and dear to ourselves are going to be underwater. Right. Uh, a friend of the desk, Andrew, might be underwater in Brooklyn. <laughs> it's that true. That would be bad. That would be terrible. Um, Jeff and I went on a, a hike yesterday near Mount Tamil Pace, and we noticed um, that there's this outcropping of houses on the beach that are very close to the water. Obviously, houses next to the water, they know how tides are gonna go. They're very mm -hmm. close. It's in the sea level wouldn't have to rise very much for that whole thing to be gone. And, you know, that kind of hits home a little bit, especially yeah. when you're out in nature. So, you know, those big shipping containers, let's, uh, let's cut them down. Yep. Let's get our stand-up Teslas fired up and ready to go. Get them going. And let's ride them off into a climate change-free sunset. Hell yeah. Official stance, climate change-free sunset, yes. So another like kind of a conspiracy uh, that I think about sometimes is what I would call like a new futurist conspiracy. Like these people who are trying to get uh, who have blood boys right. that are injecting themselves with young blood so that they can remain healthier, mm -hmm. which was a theme on uh, HBO's Silicon Valley <laughs> recently, which I'm an avid which uh, is supporter of the podcast. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So like any like 23 and me, for instance, right? Um, it's a place where you, it's a company where you can send a sample of your genetic material and they'll map it for you, right? Yeah, you, you swab your cheek, I believe. Okay. You put it in a little vial. They give you a prepackaged envelope. You mail it off and they send it back to you with a list of like, you're 16% Ukrainian and 32% more likely to drink coffee than other people. Mm-hmm. But and they keep that data. They keep the oh. sample of your DNA. And then their terms of service, some of, there's a million of them, right? There's a million of these companies. Ancestry does it. There's, yep. you, can, you can find whoever you want. There's someone trying to take your money to sequence your DNA. But some of the terms of service of these places are like, they can keep your DNA as long as they want to. That's bizarre. Which bothers me because it seems like the logical next step would be like using genes for some sort of like eugenic-like purpose or for a, a utopian, I put it in air quotes because whose utopia is it? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Design of the future. It seems like this is these are companies scrambling to jump on the designer baby trend or the AI uh, human synergy trend. Like the Ray Kurzweil line of thinking. It's like <laughs> a brave new world too. Yeah, totally. Um, I saw Ray Kurzweil speak once in Boston. Uh, and like his whole thing is that eventually technology is going to be so good, we're going to live forever. And by the year 2050, 
uh, people who are in like a really good financial standing and of really good health will be able to technically live forever because they'll solve all of the problems that come up with their health. But so the people are putting tons of money and time and thought and science behind extending life. Um, and I feel like the conspiracy theory comes in where you see all the ultra rich doing things like organizing data from 23andMe to help themselves mm -hmm. individually. Right, because the more long. you know about your about the genes that are in your DNA, mm -hmm. the more you can learn about that from people in aggregate will yep. ultimately help you out. And if you're the person who has access, even if it's scrubbed data and it doesn't have personally identifiable information in it, you're collecting a database that then you now know for sure, categorically, that gene number 1,436 definitely caused that rare skin condition that your child inherited and you know, let's try to fix that one gene with CRISPR mm -hmm. and just, you know, it's all over. Right. Or like splicing out with CRISPR uh, genetic mm -hmm. material from, so say your ex person who's in charge of 23andMe uh, with a lot of money, uh, all of this genetic data to access, you could look at it all, scan it and say, I need X, Y, and Z in order to extend my life by 150 years. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take a sample from number 500, number 237, number three, and number 1,532 yeah. uh, and give myself what I need. I have always been intrigued by these commercials. Like send, your, send your genes off. And we're, I think we do a thing on the Walnut, po Walnut Test Podcast where we alienate potential sponsors because the... <laughs> The place where I hear about these things are on podcasts. 23andMe, send us your thing. It's like, yeah, no, yeah. we're not. We're absolutely not giving them a free plug right here. I haven't come to a real internal conclusion about this yet. But the reason I've put off doing this extremely compelling task for so long is because I know that they're going to have my DNA forever. Right. And I don't know if I'm okay with that. And I don't know if that's just a weirdly like possessive thing of like, it's my DNA. It's like me. That's all that I am, really. And I don't know if I just don't want to give that up. But we also alienated a, a meal delivery service that will remain nameless on an earlier edition of our podcast. And I think we're, we might run out of sponsors soon. So if you sponsor podcasts <laughs> and you don't keep our DNA, <laughs> please reach out to us. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who else is on the shit list? Uber can't be a sponsor. No. Uh, there's a long list. We'll, we'll release a long list of sponsors we don't want. <laughs> But I think that this CRISPR thing of pulling out genes and trying to make yourself, um, you know, more eternally human, for yeah. lack of a better phrase. I would do it. I don't want to die. It kind of fits yeah. into what my narrative of what evolution, quote unquote, or the theory of evolution is becoming. And a lot of it, we, we, as the theory goes, evolved from a pile of sludge, from bacteria into larger and larger and larger Organisms and it seems like after this megafauna extinction yep. that we've been evolving smaller and we've been creating microchips that get smaller and smaller with higher densities and higher storage capacities. And it makes me wonder when you zoom out and do the whoa dude view of the universe of maybe all this life that we don't see out there has evolved to become so microscopic, just like our computer chips, just like our phone chips, and all the AI and brains and all the knowledge of their, their planets and, and ecosystems never needed to get bigger and expand yeah. to other planets. They evolved down to the most. Well, I mean, the most successful life uh, on Earth is bacteria, right? It's not us. Definitely not us. <laughs> Look who's sitting in the White House. <laughs> Damn. The bacteria don't have a clown in their White House. Nope. They knew better than to build one. So I think like we're coming to a logical close here. And I want to say, do we have an official stance on conspiracies? Because I know what I'm thinking. I have an idea of what I think Ryan is thinking. Uh -huh. I have a slight idea of what I think Jeff is thinking. What's our official stance on conspiracy theories? Are we for them? Are we lukewarm on them? I am for them. You're for that. I'm for conspiracies. I'm not for conspiracies that harm people. Um, but similar to our, our end in the placebo episode and how I kind of felt about Saturn at the beginning of this with the lighthearted intro that kind of got into some, into some depth. And, you know, that's what we do here. But I, I think that believing that you want your own conspiracy to exist 
is a thumbs up. I also think that people questioning the narrative that is being placed down upon them by positions of power is a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see a lot of harm that can come from people questioning authority, questioning their sources, and speaking out about them and trying to build communities of people who are willing to do the same. Sure. I I mean, I don't know. I have some disagreements, I think, but I need to think about them for a second here. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely an up on conspiracy theories. I think they're completely benign and, you know, even the harmful ones, on some level, people choose what they want to believe and the information is out there if they ever want to feel another way. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, the 1%, maybe it might be less than that, of conspiracy theories that are actually true and come to fruition, you know, that's a good activity in thinking, you know, for humanity's sake, basically. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Like critical thinking, basically, is what we're saying is like a positive. Yeah, right. it's right. people who think a lot right. about weird stuff. That's healthy. Yeah, and that thinking can and should be creative. And like Will said at the beginning, it's like a conversation point. We wouldn't have this episode if it weren't for conspiracy theories. That's uh, true. Yeah, I guess it's just I really believe that basing life decisions on things that are related to conspiracy theories is just dumb uh and i think we should be careful when people try to take advantage of other people similarly to what we talked about like cults cult mentality which i would argue alex jones uh is right and has a huge fan base that are cult following type people um i just think that's dangerous but the conspiracy theory itself definitely i'm cool with right yeah and the nuance that i want to add to that it goes back and it just sits it sits poorly with me so i need to revisit it yeah. When people in position of power try to disseminate fake information, like the the Kyrie thing really bothers me. Yeah. Like science has proven for a really long time and people were, were um, persecuted back in the day for speaking out for the heliocentric model. Mm-hmm. Pardon me. And we're just, I feel like we're undoing that. I feel like it's, it's a disservice to education. So I feel like totally. the nuance that I want to give to that is like, yes to critical thinking, but no to group think that goes against all all of the giants shoulders that we're standing on yeah at this point in time totally and i feel like there's um we should keep in this podcast following this through line um that's i feel like it's trying to unpack some of the problems that come with belief because in you know in our culture we don't want to say no you can't believe something you want to believe but we do want to say, yes, it's dangerous to believe some things and have your life be changed by them in specific ways. And we haven't really figured out the right and nuanced way to talk about that in a way that people don't get angry about. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. We I can try I to agree. talk toward that. I think we future. need to, I think we need to calm down the narrative in the country that someone who doesn't necessarily agree with your statement outright is your enemy. Right. And it's becoming that way. It's becoming militant. That's about all we got for conspiracies right here, but we do want to take a moment and point you to our various social media channels. We shared a comment from a friend of the desk earlier this episode, and we want to encourage that kind of interaction with this podcast. We want to reach out to you guys. We want you to reach out to us. Give us ideas, things you want to hear us talk about, things you agree with, things you disagree with. Do you think Saturn is going to become the second sun? Do you think that 23andMe at all are stealing our DNA to put in a genetic library for the future rich people? We want to hear your thoughts on this. We're just three people sitting at a desk. We want the the power of our community to come together on this. So you can check us out on Twitter at Walnut Desk Pod. You can check us out on YouTube. Just search for our channel, Walnut Desk Podcast. Um, We have a Facebook page and we have a website, walnutdeskpodcast.com. So Please feel free to visit all of those places. And as always, subscribe on iTunes, Google Play. Uh, We're available on Amazon Alexa now. Stitcher. Leave comments, reviews, thumbs ups. Uh, Just let us know what you think. And, you know, as Ryan always says. Oh, yeah. Those five star ratings on fucking iTunes. That's all we need. We talk, iTunes, we talk about sponsors and <laughs> iTunes comments, uh, like the, the five star rating with the detail, like even if you just stick a sentence or a word in there, those are great. Those are what we need. Yep. We love you guys. Thanks for being here. I'm Will. I'm Jeff. Oh. And I'm Ryan. This is a nice desk again, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>